have decided before, prior to the program, that we will have Mr. Alex Primley will be speaking uh, with his opening statement first. Please, Alex. I'd like to say thank you very much for Shabir Lee and for all who made this uh, event as a, um, possible in this mosque, in Algeria. And uh, I just want to you know, say a little bit by myself. I tried to I tried to find the whole tie. I didn't find it, so I decided to wear casual. So I hope you're okay with it. And uh, what else? I think it's. Oh, I I just started the presentation. Our topic tonight is who is the true God, the question of identity. So we have the Bible and the Quran, both books, who speaks about God. It's most likely they are like fingerprints of God in front of us. The Bible identifies uh, the God creator as Yahweh, and Quran also agrees that God revealed himself in the beginning. As, uh, as uh, in, the, in the book of the Bible, in the, in the Torah, and then in the uh, Injil. And later he built himself in the Quran under the name of Allah, the general term for God in Arabic. So, as uh, Surah 29, verse 46 says, that say, Allah spoke to Muhammad and he said, uh, and tell us to say to Jews and Christians, we believe and we trust have been revealed to us the Quran and revealed to you the Bible, our Allah God and your Allah God is one Allah. And to him we have submitted as Muslims. So, therefore we have first claim, Allah is Yahweh. Maybe a little bit informal and maybe I ask the uh, audience to be a little bit interactive with me. So if you don't mind, I'll ask you a question. Disagree with my statement, maybe you please raise your hand. So, therefore, my first question, I mean, my first statement here is I believe the Quran gives um, a yes, uh, claim, makes a claim that Allah is Yahweh. If you disagree with the claim, my Muslim audience, please raise your hand. One hand I can see. You're Muslim? Okay. I just thought so. Okay, fine. So, all agree. So, based on that, we have those assertions in the Quran. Allah claimed uh, that he gave the Torah to Moses and then he gave Zabur to uh, David and then he gave Injil to Jesus and then he gave the Quran to Muhammad. So because of that, they have uh, no contradiction be between them because they came from the same source and the Quran is from the Bible. And the third one, Allah a certain Muhammad is the last messenger in a line of long, of a long line of messengers start Adam, then uh, Noah, Moses, I mean Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus, and etc. and others. In addition, the time and description of Muhammad was recorded in the previous scriptures. So, so far so good. We have the claims and it's time to look for evidence. So, fortunately, we have both books in front of us, with us tonight, the Quran and the Bible. So all we have to do, it's a very easy job, we have to look through these books, compare them, and find out if the claim is true. So after a careful comparison between two books and stories written there, we can see they are in contradiction. The stories are not lining up, not matching up. So based on that, I am forced to say that most likely the author of the Quran and author of the Bible are not the same person. But what to do with the claim? Allah said, I am Yahweh. That's what Paramount claim. That's the claim when the plan stands or falls on it. So if, if Allah is not Yahweh, does it mean that Allah performed an uh, identity theft? Does it mean does it mean that uh, Islam is not the third monotheistic religion? Does it mean that Islam is not the religion of Abraham? Sure, then our Christian, our Bible, let's say, is corrupted. Please raise your hand. Thank you. A few hands. Thank you. So, 
So, so we we have very important topic. But then I, oh, I ask you also Christian friends, audience, if you have at least once somebody come to you as a Muslim friend via Yahweh, Allah claims that he sent the Torah and the Quran, and Allah claims that he sent Muhammad as the last messenger. And because Allah planned to send last messenger from the beginning, so he makes sure his name and description it was recorded in the previous scripture in order for Christians and Jews to recognize him as he comes. So here we have, for example, Surah 2 and 146, those to whom we gave the scripture, Jews and Christians, recognize him, Muhammad or the Kaaba at Mecca, as they recognize their sons. Then another one, 7 157. Those who follow the messenger, the prophet who can neither read or write, whom they find written with them in the Torah. So the Quran uh, came from uh, the same source as the Torah came, original ones at least. There is Quran is confirming the Torah because it came from the same source. And also the Quran overwhelmingly confirms, from my opinion, about 22 times on these pages, and you can see all the verses here. When the Quran came, it said, and the Quran came to confirm the Torah, not, not to correct, but to confirm. For the claim number four, the Quran confirms the original Bible, but the modern Bible was corrupted. So again, we'd like to see the evidence for this. And the, I mean, sorry, uh, yeah, evidence for this claim. So because we have again two books, and we also have, okay, these books you can see in the picture, they probably published within the last 50 years. But we also have manuscripts, we're going back to about 202 years, 220, 202, sorry, 2200 years from now. And the, all these manuscripts we have is Dead Sea Scrolls and Septuagin, which is Greek translation from Hebrew original, which we don't have with us. This, these two uh, sources, these two manuscripts, evidence, they are, they predate the birth of Christ for about two to three hundred years. We also have Latin Vulgate and Syriac Peshitta with us, which is a little bit later, about maybe four hundred years from, uh, from this uh, Septuagint or Dead Sea Scrolls, but yet both of them predate the coming of, or the birth of Muhammad and the coming or advent of Islam. So now, it's interesting. After we again we examine all of them, we're gonna we're gonna put them all side by side, translate to English, and we will see that all the manuscripts, in spite of the addition or omission or you know differences between them, they are actually synchronized in the stories, the way they tell the stories of prophets, the doctrines, and everything, and they will be. Uh, they're virtually the same with the Bible we have right now. So we cannot find difference in those pages between the story of Jonah, for example, or David. It will be transmitted exactly the same. Of course, and you will never find the name or description of Muhammad written in those pages. Because of all these ancient, ancient manuscripts or documents, are in agreement with each other, and because of, of that, they prove that the claim of Allah and some Muslims are false. So, my Muslim friends, in order to defend Islam in the face of such overwhelming monastery evidence, you must produce one, not many, but just one document, ancient document of the Hebrew, Torah, or Tanakh, which will substantiate all the claims so far made. But this document must satisfy some very specific characteristics. Number one, it must predate the birth of Muhammad. Number two, it must tell the stories of the prophets very closely to the same ones in the Quran. And number three, it must contain the name and description of Prophet Muhammad in the stage. Well, it 
should be very closely to the Quran as we know it now. So, here's a question to my Muslim audience, Dr. Shabir. Can you produce the document? Not. Can you tell us where we can find this ancient manuscript, in which museum, and how it's called, and where was it discovered in the first place? So, so far we have four claims and not one evidence. So then I say to you, I have a suggestion for you. Because if you don't have an evidence like that, why don't you withdraw your claim of Allah of the Quran being the true God until such manuscript that support all four claims of Islam will be discovered. And of course, you should refrain or stop all accusation against the Jewish and Christian scripture. But now I'd like to talk about Isnad. So Isnad is the list of authorities who have uh, transmitted a report of a statement or action or tradition of Muhammad. So that's how it works. Abu Huraira heard from Ibn Abbas, who heard from Aisha, who heard from the Prophet Muhammad, said. Of course, because of uh, Muslims know all, everything about these characters or the persons, the hadith bearing such isnad, chain of transmitters, will be authority. But do you know that Quran also has isnad? Let me explain. Abu Huraira heard from the Prophet Muhammad, who heard from Jibril, who heard that Allah said. Now, the only difference here is, we know who Abu Huraira is, we know who Prophet Muhammad is, but how many Muslims actually met Jibril, heard him speak, or met Allah, heard him speak. So I think we might have a broken snap here. That's what, but again, Muslims trust the Muhammad. Right? So whatever Muhammad said, it goes. But... There's a possibility, maybe, that Muhammad made a mistake, or he was misled, or he was influenced by other people. So that brings us back to the beginning of the Islam. 1406 years roughly ago, Muhammad ibn Abdullah was running from the cave of Hira back to his wife Khadija, and he was terrified. Now, what happened then, she asked him after his fear was gone, what happened to you, Muhammad? So he explained her that his experience with a violent uh, visitor. And then he said, I am afraid that something might happen to me. Basically, he said, I'm afraid that the same demon who came to visit, visit me in the cave of Hira will come again and continue to torture me. On that answer, Khadija replied, as a good wife, she said, never, by Allah, Allah will never disgrace you. You, good, you keep good relations with your kids and kin, help the poor and the destitute, serve your guests generously, and assist the deserving calamity afflicted once. Then, but it was not enough, so she didn't change his mind. So what happened is, she took him into the presence of her cousin Baraka, who was Christian according to the tradition. He was uh, he was knowledgeable guy with Hebrew scripture. And well, he was blind at his old age. When he heard the story of Muhammad, he said, this is the same one who keeps the secrets, the angel Gabriel, whom Allah has sent to Moses. These words actually changed the history. And Muhammad believed in it. Because, well, so Muhammad was illiterate, he was ignorant of the scripture, definitely, and Baraka was literate, and he knew the Bible, so he knew better than Muhammad. So Muhammad kind of agreed with him, and Islam was born. Now, we, so let's state again, five, now it's five claims Islam has. So the first claim is, again, let me repeat, Allah claimed to be Yahweh. Second claim, Allah claimed that he sent the Torah and the Quran. Allah claimed that Muhammad was his messenger and he sent them, uh, Moses and then he sent Muhammad. Then 
some of them claim that Torah was changed and we don't have a good Bible with us, trustworthy Bible with us. And now the fifth claim, Baraka claimed that Muhammad met with the angel of Yahweh, whose name was Jibril, the same angel who came also to Moses. And now again it's the time to ask for evidence. So here we have a story of God, of God meeting with Moses. First time, versus the story of visitor and Muhammad in the Cape of Hira. So we know the story very well, I believe so. And then when after the story with uh, when Moses met with God, he left the presence of God armed not only with a message, not only with words, but also with miracles literally in his hands. And then he met with Aaron, his brother. He convinced Aaron. And then both of them went. And Aaron now speaking on behalf of Moses. And he convinced elders of Israel. And we have a great thing called Exodus, both recorded in the Bible and in the Quran. But do you see differences? Now, we will compare both stories. We see that because of, uh, well, Mo Moses was sure when he left this burning bush place, he was sure God was talking to him directly. And he, was, he managed to convince, uh, convince everybody else about this experience. But when we look at the story of Prophet Muhammad, after he left the cave of Hira, he was sure it was a demonic experience. So after he met Khadija and then Varaka, who were not eyewitnesses, and, it's, and on top of that, Varaka was blind. So nevertheless, they managed to reverse his claims back, and he, they changed his mind. It's not what happened with the story of Moses. So therefore, I could say that the story of uh, the Varaka made quite a big mistake here by comparing and saying the story of Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad and the story of Moses is the same one and the same person from God came to both of them. So here's a short comparative point. So we have again all these claims and we don't have evidence for each one of them. And the evidence again, what I try to say is because we have our Bible, we have manuscripts which goes back to about 200, 2,200 years from today. We have most of them, they predict of, uh, they are predates of Muhammad and coming of Quran. And all of them will be very different. The stories of the prophets will be very different from the stories of prophets in the Quran. Again, I have to stress out that you have to find, in order to prove your claims, you have to find only one evidence. You have to find the Old Testament revision too, okay, which is very close to the Quranical narration, which is which predates the birth of Muhammad, very close to the Quranical narration in every story of the prophet and doctrines, and also has the name of Muhammad written on that page. Otherwise, I suggest you to remove the claim of Allah being the true God until you find such evidence and give it to us. And also, please refrain from accusing our scripture. Therefore, after saying that, I want to conclude. Among the thousands of ten thousands of ancient biblical manuscripts available, which were written in different time periods and cultures, no one agrees with, supports, or confirms the person and character of Allah of the Quran. Yet they all agree with each other about the character of Yahweh of the Bible. So Islam, Islam's claims about the identity of Allah are without any supportive evidence. Therefore I conclude that the name and identity of the true God is Yahweh, not Allah. And to him belongs our worship. My Muslim friends, the quest before you has a tremendous value for your soul. If you are if you follow the wrong path, you'll, you will end up in the wrong destiny. I'm here tonight not to argue that Yahweh is you know, more just or more merciful or more 
loving or more holy than Allah. I'm just here to argue that Allah is not a God and Yahweh is only God who we should worship and trust. And his identity could be found only in the Bible, not in the Quran. And the Bible teaches the truth about him. So therefore, my Muslim friends, I invite you now to the faith of Biblical Adam, Biblical Abraham, Biblical Jonah, Biblical David, and Biblical Jesus. Thank you. Alex. Next we'll have Dr. Shabir on stage for his 20 minute opening statement. Hello everybody. Thank you all for coming out here tonight. Uh, I want to begin by praising our creator and fashioner, uh, the creator of the heavens and the earth and asking to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets and messengers. Uh, especially the last of all, well, of all of them, after whose name Muslims generally say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that being Arabic for peace and the mercy and blessings of God uh, be with him. Uh, and I'd like to also pray for uh, all of us here tonight. I ask God to uh, bring happiness in our lives, remove every distress and calamity, uh, and uh, every grief and anxiety from uh, our hearts and minds. And uh, may he open up our hearts here tonight so that we can understand the truth that he would like us to understand, that truth which will set us all free. Now, Alex uh, delivered uh, a very nice presentation, and uh, I, I don't know if I can match uh, his presentation in terms of beauty and eloquence, uh, but uh, I'll do the best uh, that I can. Uh, our topic tonight, as you know, is who is the true God, a question of identity. And I feel that for a large part of Alex's presentation, he was dealing with other subjects. Is the Quran the word of God? Is Muhammad uh, really a prophet of God? Uh, and is the Torah uh, still intact or is it corrupt? Uh, and so on. Uh, these topics are interesting topics in and of themselves, uh, but I do not uh, think that they are so uh, pertinent to our topic at hand tonight. The, the real question is, who precisely is God? And uh, I, I will put forward a few points and then uh, get more specifically to what Alex was saying. So uh, the God of, of uh, the Jews, as we know, is Yahweh, as uh, Alex agreed. And uh, Christians say Jehovah. In, in the Old Testament of the Christian Bible, Yahweh is rendered as uh, Jehovah in the King James Version of the Bible. And Jehovah's Witnesses, as you know, take this to be uh, the prime name of God which they celebrate and circulate. And, of course, that uh, always refers to one God. Now, to continue, the God of Muslims is, according to the Quran, the same God of Judaism, and Muslims have rightly confessed to that when Alex asked, uh, do you guys uh, think that Allah is the same God as Yahweh? Uh, no Muslim objected to that. Yes. So we agree that Yahweh and Jehovah is the same God, and that's the one that we call Allah. Now, the God of many Christians, on the other hand, uh, is that, uh, according to them, Jehovah uh, is a trinity, uh, comprising the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So now, uh, I want to say that uh, there are three areas uh, of uh, evidence that point uh, to the Muslim uh, Jewish God to be the correct God, and that, uh, at the same time, pointing to the idea that the Christian uh, rendition of, of the trinity is really a deviation from uh, the Judeo uh, heritage, uh, the Judaic heritage. So the three points I want to make uh, will uh, each be linked to one of the first three letters that spell the word three. That's why I've rendered the three letters there in capital and the rest in lower case. So T-H-R. For, uh, for the T, I would say that stands for text. So we'd look at text that point towards who exactly is God. For the H, I would say that stands for history and we would look at the history of, of how uh, Christianity came to have a different belief than Jews regarding God. And uh, finally, the R for reason, we would look at some reasonable uh, examination of the Christian trinity and the idea that there is only one God. So let me start with reason. Uh, a, a gentleman who I've met here for the first time uh, tonight uh, has uh, requested that I say something uh, about the galaxies and the stars, and, and uh, he mentioned also specifically the Andromeda galaxy. Well, the way that ties into my topic here, I wasn't planning to speak about that at all, but uh, to tie that in, 
uh, we know today the vastness of space, and we realize that a human being walking on the earth could not have created all of these things. But in ancient times, it was quite common for people to take human beings as God, and they somehow imagined that these human beings might have created all of the, what they see. But of course, they didn't see that much. Hubble had not uh, been born yet, and the Hubble telescope was not used to see the vastness uh, of space. More uh, to the point, when we come to the idea of the Christian Trinity, uh, great Christian thinkers have said that reason does not lead us to the Trinity. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, for example, in the Middle Ages, who developed many proofs for the existence of God, proofs which uh, are used even by Muslim uh, thinkers, uh, said that uh, reason does not lead you uh, to uh, the belief in the Trinity. You may first accept that there is a Trinity, and you have that certainty of faith, but it's not reason that gets you there. Uh, reason may lead you to the belief that there is one God, and that, of course, is the belief of Jews and uh, Muslims. Uh, now, if we continue and look at the history, and what we see is that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam follow a, a singular line of development. One can say that Christianity developed out of Judaism, and uh, from a historical critical perspective, one would also say that Islam developed out of the same line that led from Judaism to Christianity, and here we have the religion of Islam. So we expect a continuity uh, of certain basic ideas, or uh, we might, uh, we would need an explanation for the discontinu discontinuity. So where is the discontinuity? Is it in Islam or is it in Christianity? And uh, what I would put before you, ladies and gentlemen, is that the discontinuity is in Christianity. Judaism did not have the concept of a trinity. Uh, Islam maintains the Jewish belief that there is only one God, the one who is called Yahweh in the Bible, and now called uh, Allah in the Quran. Uh, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, we would argue, uh, followed the same line of historical development with uh, the teachings emphasizing that there is only one God. For example, uh, we know from, from the Bible that Abraham referred to God as El Shaddai, the Mighty One. And when it is said that God appeared to Moses uh, in the Bible, God said that I had appeared previously to Abraham as El Shaddai. And now, Moses' declaration to the people in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4 in the Bible is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Now, that became a very important declaration in Judaism, and uh, Jews repeat it to this very day. Uh, they are required by the Bible uh, to write this and tie it on their foreheads and on their arms and to nail it on their doorposts so that they should never forget this teaching. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Ero Israel, the Lord of our God, the Lord is one. Now, when Jesus came on the scene, and according to Mark's Gospel, Jesus was teaching the same thing. In Mark chapter 12, a man came to him and said to him, Good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And, and, and Jesus, well, I started to mention Mark chapter 12, but I'm in chapter 10 now. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. And so here, Jesus is uh, apparently denying that he is that one God. Now back to chapter 12, where, which is where I began. Uh, in chapter 12, another man came to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, of all of the commandments, which is the greatest? And Jesus said, The greatest is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You see what Jesus has done now? He has repeated the same commandment which the Jews continue to tie on their foreheads and on their wrists and nail on their doorposts, that there is only one God. And then it says in Mark's Gospel that the man said to him, uh, Teacher, you are right, there is only one God, and besides him there is no other. So the man understood what Jesus was saying. And when, Jesus, when the man is saying to Jesus, you are right, there is only one God, and besides him there is no other, so obviously the man does not mean that Jesus is his God. The one God that he's referring to is someone else other than Jesus. And that's the one that Muslims refer to in the Arabic language by saying Allah. Now, it is curious that Alex has taken that line of argumentation uh, because it, it, when Christians who are Arabic speakers read their Arabic translations of the Bible, what do they find? In the beginning, of uh, the, the book of Genesis says, uh, In the 
in the beginning, God created the heavens and the, and the earth, but the word for God there in Arabic is Allah, and that's in Christian translations of the Bible. This was not invented by Muslims. This is what Christians call God. One of my first early debates uh, uh, when I started out many decades ago doing things like this uh, was with uh, Dr. Robert Morey. And he spent a great deal of his, uh, well, the whole, um, his whole presentation and argumentation was that uh, Allah is a, a strange God. It's not the right God. And then, in the end, a, a, a priest who was part of his entourage came to pray. And he actually spoke the Semitic languages. And when he came to pray, he was actually referring to God as Allah in, in the prayer at the end of that whole debate. So it, it seems that some Christians want to show that Islam is so wholly different, that their God is entirely different, the book is all wrong, their prophet is a false prophet. And so they take this kind of extreme polemical stance. But if they were to talk to their own colleagues within their faith, and investigate how the words are used in the various languages, they will see that the word Allah in Arabic actually corresponds to Eloh in the Bible. And Yahweh is not the only name used for God in the Bible, but also El, and as I've mentioned previously, El Shaddai. And the Arabic Allah actually is traced by biblical scholars and others as being in correspondence with El, or in the longer form, Eloh. Uh, which is in the Bible as a name uh, for God. Uh, so to continue then, we see that there is this uh, historical continuation between Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. They were all speaking about the same one uh, God. But now, uh, let's look at the text that might be presented. Some uh, look at the biblical text and they find references to uh, Jesus being somehow uh, divine. And they try to convince Muslims, either you must accept this text uh, as sometimes being spoken by Jesus, uh, or uh, if you are not going to accept this text as spoken by Jesus, uh, doesn't that put you in a quandary? Because you say that Jesus is a true prophet, and look at some of the things that he said. Some of the things that he said would indicate that he's greater than a human being, and since Muslims would not accept that, would Muslims think that Jesus is a false prophet? But... They, 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 to undermine this entire line of argumentation, the Muslim should just simply point out that uh, some of the texts which are being shown to us as uh, sayings of Jesus are not really his original sayings. Let me get into the details of that. We see the same sort of historical continuation uh, between the Christian and Muslim scriptures. We see, for example, uh, on your far left, there is the Old Testament, which comprises the Torah, and uh, the Psalms and other writings. Um, I didn't mention the prophets there because I wanted to focus on the books which Muslims would recognize easily. Muslims believe uh, that there is a Torah, which is a book of God, and there is the Psalms, which we equate somehow with the Zabur, though it's not, that equation is not necessary. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, we'll stick with that basic level of inquiry at this moment. So the Torah and the Psalms, Muslims recognize these names. Then we go to what is called the New Testament, in which we have the Gospels and other writings. Basically, the Old and New Testaments together uh, comprise the Christian Bible. Now, the Quranic claim is that the Quran basically is the final revelation from God. It is a book that continues the teachings of the previous prophets and the previous uh, scriptures. Alex took great issue with that, and he's saying, no, the Quran cannot be... A, a, a continuation of the previous uh, scriptures because, look, the name of Muhammad is not mentioned uh, in the previous scriptures. But notice that Christians also said that the New Testament is a continuation of the Old, that Jesus was predicted in the Old Testament. But notice that there is not one verse in the entire Old Testament that mentions the name Jesus. It mentions the name Joshua, which actually is similar to the name of Jesus, but that was somebody else named Joshua or Yeshua uh, in, in the Hebrew, or Yahoshua. Uh, but Christians find statements in the Old Testament referring to Jesus, they think, whereas if one analyzes those statements, one will see that they're very broad and vague, and they can refer to Jesus, they can refer to somebody before Jesus, and also refer to somebody after Jesus. Take, for example, the statements in the book of Genesis, where after the man and woman... Uh, fell into the, the sin, 
God said to the, to the woman that the serpent will strike at the heel of your offspring, but your offspring will crush its head, the serpent's head. Now, given the description there at the time, as Daryl Bach pointed out, Eve might have thought that this applied to her first-generation child, first-generation offspring, her son, literally. So one of her sons might have been bitten by the serpent, but the serpent would crush its head. Christians apply this to Jesus coming, I don't know how many millennia later on, because nobody knows the exact uh, uh, age of the uh, of, of human existence on, on earth, though the Jewish Bible clocks this as uh, some 6,000 years ago. The Christians say that the offspring of Eve that was being spoken about here is Jesus. So, the far cry to say that this refers to Jesus. It could have applied to any one of the offsprings of Eve. It could have applied to anyone who came in with a message that turned people away from the evil calling of Satan and brought them towards uh, what is good and right and fair. And in that case, it could apply to the Prophet Muhammad as well. So what we would ask our Christian friends to do is to look at the verses carefully that Alex put up from the Quran, which say, those to whom we have given the scripture, they know him, that is Muhammad, as they know their sons. In what way would they know him? Today, Muslims might be thinking, okay, where can we find Muhammad in the Old Testament? But that's not what God is telling Muslims to do. God is actually addressing the Christians and the Jews and saying to them, you know how you have been using certain interpretive methods to identify persons that's being spoken about? Use those same methods and see if they do not point to Muhammad instead. So what methods of Christians use uh, uh, and Jews, but especially Christians now in finding passages that point to Christ, they say, uh, they would use, for example, typology. There was something happening in the Old Testament, and somehow that points towards Jesus. Though it doesn't mention his name, doesn't actually describe him. For example, people were sacrificing, uh, sacrificing animals in the temple. They say when Jesus came, he was that ultimate sacrifice, and what the people were doing before sacrificing animal that actually points to Jesus. It's called typology. You see the connection between the two is very vague and in fact one would say that there is no connection. Actually the opposite is being done here because whereas God was telling people uh, you can sacrifice the animals and you will be forgiven and if God was telling people don't sacrifice your children, now God does the opposite and sacrifices his own son. Uh, so really the opposite is happening here. And if one were to use uh, such interpretive methods, but use them in a fair manner, we would ask, do these methods not point to the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace? What about Midrash? Midrash uh, is a method by which the Jewish scholars and the writers of the New Testament uh, found statements in the Old Testament, and they say that though these statements speak about the immediate context, uh, these somehow point to something in the future. That's Midrash. What about Pesho? It's another interpretive method by which they would start with something happening here at the time, and they would go back into the scriptures to see if perhaps there is something that in the scriptures that would explain our present circumstance. So let's ask our Jew Jewish and Christian friends, have you really applied these methods to try and find if the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is spoken in your Old and New Testament? Or have you just simply dismissed him from the start? I think the latter. So to continue then, uh, we see that in the Bible there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, but I need to focus on two. One is Mark, and the other is John. Now, Mark is the first of the four Gospels to be written. John is the last of the four. I want you to remember this. First Mark, John last. Want to remember this? Think that, you know, to start a race, first you get on your mark. Okay, first Mark. And think of John coming last. Johnny come lately, a song says. Okay? If you remember this, you will see that often our Christian friends are, are quoting passages to prove that Jesus is divine, and the passages would generally come more likely from, Mark, from John's gospel than from Mark's gospel. Why? Because over time, the sayings of Jesus have been transformed to be made more Christian, and Jesus has been promoted as God. So he starts off to be down here in Mark, but he goes up there in John. 
and like a story of a fish being caught and every time the story is being retold the fish gets bigger you can see that Jesus is becoming bigger and greater in all of these stories as the stories are being recounted and retold from one gospel to another that means that when Islam calls uh, Jesus a servant and messenger of God Islam has got it right when Islam says that there is only one God and he's not a trinity Islam has actually got it right this is taking us back to the original concept that there is only one God, the one God of Judaism who was called Yahweh and Jehovah, and uh, I, I'm aware of the time, I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, I've got like 15, uh, 10 seconds left. Uh, so that one God who is called Yahweh and Jehovah in the Christian and Jewish Bibles is now called Allah in the Quran, as he's also called in Arabic translations of the Bible, that is the true God, that is how we identify him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shakir. So now we have an idea of where each speaker is coming from, what they're, uh, what they're, what they want to mention, what we're, what they're going to be talking about today, and where they stand. So after that, we're, we're entering our response time. So now we'll, we'll we'll give ten minutes to each speaker to kind of respond to what the their other speaker has said and kind of um, go in on depth now into after the opening statements on the topic. So Alex, please. The second line of the Torah, he continues, says Muhammad is a messenger of Allah. His nations are constantly praising the praise of Allah, etc. And that's uh, it's authentic hadith. Okay. So we have few Islamic sources which uh, these guys are Sahabas of Muhammad, the companions of Muhammad, who basically said, well, you just remove the name and description of Muhammad from the Torah. And the idea is the description of Muhammad was removed is, as I said, Muhammad is, Ibn Abdullah was born in Mecca, was immigrated to Taibar, and his dominion will be Sham, end quote. That was allegedly been uh, thrown uh, on the face of Jews by Muslim scholars or Sahabas, that they remove from the Torah. So again, what I try to say in my presentation, that we have both texts on our hands. We have, what's interesting, we have, when we open the Bible, well, I, when I stand on the street, young and under, I don't, I don't like to keep on the New Testament. I like to give away full Bibles. And the reason is because I preach gospel to anybody from Genesis on the Old Testament, through entire Old Testament, Sometimes the Muslim, I don't need them to go to New Testament. I finish with Old Testament, and I make my point. If I will see a Jew, I will not going to use New Testament to prove his point, or prove my point to him. So the Old Testament is a foundation for every Christian. That's what I believe. So therefore, in our Bible, we have Old Testament and then New Testament. But yet again, in the Quran, we don't have Old Testament, New Testament, and the Quran on top. For example, the Mormon Bible of Mormons, they did it. They have the Old Testament, New Testament, and Book of Mormon. I saw personally that thickest Bible in my life. Huh? And the Quran, it doesn't have it. So we have it. So we can claim a continuation because Christ was a Jew. He was in line, as we believe, on the prophets and messenger of God. Now, the Quran came a little bit disconnect because, first of all, the Muhammad was an Arab and now he has very strange experience and what we have really is, uh, with us is the Quran. And as I start comparing Quran and the Bible about 15 years ago, I was shocked to see how inconsistency occur when we bring both texts together. So for me it's very important. I have a couple of minutes, I try to point just one example for you. When you read the story of David killing Goliath in the Quran, you have the story mentioned in a, basically one word, verse. But just before that, it was Saul and his army coming to the river. And the Quran stated that Saul came to the river and he said basically, if you're going to drink too much, you're not of me. And many people drank too much from the river, except few. And they crossed the river, and they faced Jalut, Goliath, and his army. And then they fought against him, and they put them to fight, flight, and David came to life. That's 
generally the story in the Quran. Now, as a Christian, a Jew, as I'm reading this story, kind of I get a little bit, you know, puzzled because it seems to me we have a story of Gideon, which occurred about 200 years ago when he came to the river and God asked him to reduce the size of his army from 30 to 1,000. And he said in the beginning, listen, everybody who was afraid, go away, go home, that's fine, we don't need you. 22,000 left, 10,000 remained. But yet God said, listen, there's too many of them, I don't want to give you victory over Midianites because you will think that, oh, we are powerful guys and we did it. So therefore, bring people to the river and I will test them. And whosoever drinks certain way, just putting hands on the, on the banks and drinking with the mouth, you know, don't take them. Only people who will drink uh, with the palm of his hand, of their hands, take them. So and what happened is only 300 people drank a certain way. And, me, and the Gideon went with them and defeated Midianites. It was no fight even. 200 years later, David killed Goliath in different, different place with different enemy. So somehow I see how come the author of one, one book tells a story one way, and the same author tells a story completely different way. So that was my main concern. And of course, I just show you one example out of probably many dozens. My time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Dr. Shabir. Uh, thank you, Alex, for that engaging uh, rebuttal. Uh, now, you, re re you recall, uh, folks, that I said that uh, I have three main uh, subject areas to discuss, reason, history, and text, all pointing to uh, the Muslim belief in God rather than to the Christian belief. I think uh, Alex glossed over all of the re uh, these three points. He started talking about the reason, but he didn't say much, and then he jumped to text, and I don't see him saying much about the history. Uh, but he did say that uh, the earliest Muslims uh, thought that uh, Muhammad's name was mentioned in the Bible. If that is true, that some of the earliest Muslims thought so, that does not mean that this is a fact, because uh, we believe that God is infallible, and that he revealed his message to his prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and made him an infallible deliverer of his message. But that infallibility does not transfer uh, to the earliest Muslims. They might have believed some things incorrectly, especially when they were informed uh, by people of the other faiths. They transmitted a large stock of information which came to be noted in our Quranic commentaries as Israeliyat, the Israelite stories. And uh, generally, we don't consider those stories to be authentic. Many of these stories are transmitted through Qab al-Ahbar, whom Alex had mentioned. Now, he uh, mentioned Uthman ibn Affan, who is a very well-respected figure in our history, but Uthman ibn Affan did not write down his own sayings. What we have now as reported sayings of, of him are recorded some hundreds of years later by later authorities. They were first transmitted by word of mouth, and we cannot take these to be dependable sayings. So altogether, I think Alex's case here is built on very weak foundations. It's like, you know, if this, then that, and if, then that, that. It's too many ifs along the way. If Osman said this, he could have been mistaken, but uh, it, he may not have said this because it was actually recorded much later, and so on. So it's an if built on an if. Uh, Alex pointed out to the fact that uh, there are uh, discrepancies between the way the Quran tells a story and the way the Bible tells a story. Sidney Griffith has written a book on this subject entitled The Bible in Arabic. And in this book, Sidney Griffith shows that the Quranic intention is actually to correct the narratives in the Bible. And in one story after another, we will see this happening. Uh, he mentioned the story of Goliath, which is not so familiar to most people, but I'll just mention one little aspect of that. From Sunday school, we recall that, uh, you know, David uh, slew Goliath with, uh, with a slingshot. And, and that's when I started taking an interest in slingshots as, as a boy. But what we were not told in the Bible is that uh, it, David actually, after knocking him to the ground in this way, actually severed his head and came back with the severed head. Well, uh, in the Quran tells the story in, in a less violent way by just simply saying, وَقَتَلَ دَاوُدُ جَالُوتِ 
David killed Goliath. That's the end of the story. The, the bloody, gory violence that is mentioned there in the story in the Bible is not repeated in the Quran. The Quran is actually setting up a new way of looking at all of these stories. In my previous uh, presentation, I mentioned that the book of Genesis where Eve and her husband were deceived, right? Remember that story? And we all know the story from Sunday school. Well, uh, at the end of it all, uh, the, uh, the woman was cursed by God. According to God, she will bear children in pain, and yet her desire will be for her husband. Well, in the Quran, there's no such curse on women. Uh, in fact, whereas in the Bible it says that the serpent first convinced the woman to eat from the fruit, and then she gave it to her husband, and then he ate as though he was like an innocent participant in the whole thing, and betrayed by his wife. And later on in the New Testament, the point will be made that it wasn't uh, the, the man who was uh, in the first instance betrayed, but it was the woman who was betrayed. Now in the Quran, it simply says that Satan whispered to the two of them and caused the two of them to, be, to slip from the state of grace in which they were. There's one passage in the Quran where Adam is specifically blamed in the 20th chapter of the Quran in the 120th uh, verse. But in no verse in the Quran is Eve specifically blamed. She's never shown to be the betrayer of her husband. And uh, by extension, women are not shown to be the betrayers of their husbands uh, and men in general in the Quran. See, the Quran is, is actually giving us a, a different version of the story, but deliberately so. Uh, some will say, oh, it looks like Muhammad didn't really know what the Bible actually said. But as Sidney Griffith is pointing out, there is a high quotient of biblical knowledge in the Quran. It's not that the Quran is ignorant of what the Bible says. The, it, it, the fact is that the Quran knows so precisely what the Bible says that the Quran knows the specific point of departure from the story as it was in the Bible in order to bring out the Quranic uh, theology uh, based on these stories. So we can go on and on, but we have other points to, to mention. Uh, we, we, if we continued, we would see that uh, in, in story after story, the Quran is actually, as Sidney Griffith uh, pointed out, correcting the Bible. Now, it brings me back then to what we said about Muhammad in the Bible. Uh, some Muslims may have thought, yeah, we'll go to the Bible and find the name of Muhammad. If we don't find the name there, it must be that the Jews and Christians took it out. Not necessarily so. Uh, the, take, for example, Surah 7, verse number 157, which Alex had put up on his screen previously. It says, uh, He whom they will find mentioned with them in the Torah and the Injil. So they will find. There's a difference between they will find and you Muslims will find. Muslims don't know how to read the Bible. They don't know how to interpret the Bible. They don't understand this typology and midrash and pesher uh, methods of interpretation. So who knows these methods? The Jews and the Christians. So now Jews in the time of, the, of Jesus, according to the New Testament, were expecting a prophet to come. And they were expecting Elijah to return. And they were expecting the Christ to come. Now, according to John's Gospel, it is clear that Jesus is the Christ. So now the question is, who is that prophet whom they were expecting? So now the Jews say, okay, uh, we don't believe Jesus is that prophet. So then, it is for the Jews to answer then, if you were expecting a prophet and Jesus came and you said he was not that prophet, well that means you're still expecting a prophet. So who is that prophet? The Muslim answer is that the prophet is the prophet Muhammad on whom be peace. In the New Testament, Jesus on whom be peace obviously speaks about somebody to come after him. But what the New Testament writers have done, especially the Gospel according to John as we have seen, there's this development in the story. The later the gospel, the more they make Jesus the be-all and end-all, till they make him like a divine person. So, that now, the New Testament story about Jesus is that God used to send prophets in the past, but now God sent his son. So now that the son has come, there's no need for any prophets. You see, that's the uh, clear implication of the way in which Jesus has been presented in the New Testament. But once we realize that it's not Jesus who has done this, it is the Christian writers of the New Testament who have actually presented the matter thus, then we realize that Jesus did not end the line of prophets. See the whole logic of the story. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse number 18, speaks of a prophet to come after Moses. And Christian commentators, for example, in the New Jerome Biblical Commentary, have said that it doesn't mean one prophet, it means that there will be a whole line of prophets. Whenever there is a need for a prophet, God will send one. Okay, now if you ask a Muslim, 
So who is the last prophet? The Muslim will say the Prophet Muhammad. How do you know that? The Muslim will say because Surah 33 of the Quran, verse number 40 says, he is Khatim and Nabiyyin, he is the seal of the Prophet. So here's the end of it. Ah, oh, okay. Now let's ask our Christian friends, who is the last prophet? Well, they will say, maybe Malachi that was the last prophet. Maybe John the Baptist was the last prophet. And if you call Jesus a prophet, okay, then he must have been the last prophet because he was, in addition to being the last prophet, he was the son of God. Okay, how do you know he was the son of God? Well, evidence from the later Gospels. And once we realize that it's the later Gospels who have promoted Jesus to that status, and he never claimed to be son of God, now we're back to him being a prophet. Okay, so he was a prophet. How do you know he was the last prophet? He never said he was the last prophet. That means that there could be a prophet after him. And when Jesus was speaking about false prophets to come and showing this is how you recognize the false prophets, that means there is a differentiation between the true prophet and the false prophet. If somebody comes and claims to be a prophet, you will recognize him uh, by his uh, fruits and differentiate between the true and the false prophet on that basis. If he's giving them a way of differentiating between true and false prophets, that means there is a possibility of a true prophet coming. So he asked then, why do you exclude Muhammad from the very start? Moreover, I would argue, and I have less, a little bit more than half a minute remaining, I would argue that when Jesus spoke about the paraclete to come after him, he was referring not to the Holy Spirit, but to another human being and another prophet. But Christians have styled this to make it look like it's another spirit, a spirit coming, not a human being. And the most stark way in which they have done this is in John chapter 14, verse 26, where they specifically say the paraclete, the Holy Spirit. But C.K. Barrett, in his commentary on John's Gospel, has pointed out that possibly uh, this is a later emendation. It's not the original where it says the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shabir. We will now allow another five minutes for each speaker for further responses. Alex? While we're setting up the slides, I would just like to bring up the fact that after this will be our question and answer service. So ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, if you have any questions, don't be hesitant, put your hands up. We have some volunteers going around with a black shirt with the green writing. And uh, they'll get you some pens, some pads, and just write, write down the question. And they'll come back in a few minutes and just take it. Don't be shy, ladies and gentlemen. Put your hands up and get your questions asked. Any problem with the slideshow? Okay, it's starting up. Sorry for the time. So I was very interested to hear that uh, Shabir said that Ibn Kantir mentioned certain things. Ibn Kathir uh, mentioned something unreliable information, like Ibn Uthman ibn Affan or Kabul Ahbar saying it's not really good source. Well, I agree with him. I don't believe all this what is said is trustworthy. Nevertheless, I want to also mention about it, about Ibn Kathir. You remember the story of Jonah in the Quran and in the Bible, okay? Briefly saying, the story of Jonah in the Bible, in the Quran, is Jonah was from Nineveh. Jonah went of sailing. He went, uh, ended up in the belly of the fish. He was delivered by Allah command, and then he was on a shore sick, and then it was uh, the plant grew over him, and then Allah sent him to many people. It's about 10 verses, I believe. Very plain story, of course, in the Bible we have 32 verses, more details and everything. But what we have here is Ibn Kathir who steps in to help the Quran to make it, to put some colors in the picture. So what he said, in his book, uh, Stories of Prophets, he said about Jonah that he was Ninevite, originally Ninevite. He was preaching in Nineveh for so long 
and eventually he, uh, he was fed up with the people because they don't want to believe in him. So he left the city of Nineveh, and as he was leaving, thinking that the uh, wrath of God will come, it's actually happening. The red skies appeared in front uh, above the Nineveh, and Ninevites were so afraid they repented, and Allah withdrew his punishment from them. And meanwhile, Jonah was boarding the ship. All day, the ship was sailing in a good weather, but at nightfall, it was a storm happens, and waves, and eventually he was overboard, and fish swallow him, etc. So I want to point on something which Ibn Kathir said, very interesting. Here we can see on the picture over there, it's plan of city of Nineveh. Do you know what city of Nineveh called today? Mosul. It's in the northern Iraq. So according to the story of the Ibn Kathir, and probably that's what he talking about the Quran as well, so Nineveh, in order for Jonah to go the boat, he, he has to go to the Tigris River and sail down to Persian Gulf. But the problem is here, the Nineveh, between Nineveh and Persian Gulf is about 1,000 kilometers. Even Kathir said specifically, implicitly, that it was daytime when Nineveh, when Jonah was traveling in a good weather, but by nightfall the huge waves comes, so the seas, get stormed. Uh, and what happens here, in order for Nineveh, for the small boat with Jonah, reach the Gulf, he needs to have 12 hours, supposedly on daytime, you have to drive with the boat with a speed of 83.33 kilometers an hour, on average. And it is 11.26 times faster than any ancient ship. So I just wonder what kind of fuel they use. Okay? So that, uh, you can see how inconsistent the Ibn Kathir is in his story. Now, uh, also I want to say about, again, the story of David and Goliath and how the Quran is very, you know, preserving and keeping our audience, um, uh, like almost talking to, um, what's good, uh, try to avoid all the gruesome details. But does it mean it's never happened this way, as you know, Gideon killed Goliath and said what he said? Probably it happens this way. But also, my point was not about how he killed it, or how he killed, did it kill Goliath, but I want to emphasize why two stories, which in the Bible separated by 200 years, they are actually combined in one story in the Quran. So that was my point. So if the Quran is sent by the same God, Yahweh, who sent to our information to all the prophets and the stories we hear from them. How come the same author is giving completely different reports? It's almost like one, one author of the Quran didn't know what happened with the Torah, stories of the Torah. That's why I see the discrepancies and I, um, in time my presentation basically I try to point out that those discrepancies between the Quran and the Bible, specifically with the Torah and the Old Testament, because the Quran very um, comparatively very little speaks about uh, the New Testament in terms of Christ being uh, not Trinity and being not crucified, but spent a lot of time talking about and retelling the stories of Old Testament prophets. And there we, you, can, you can read and uh, you know, compare both stories, of all stories of prophet between one book and another one, you can see huge amount of these differences. That's why my question is, well, if, if we don't have other Torah, which is very close to the Quran in their narratives, very close to the Quran in explaining and predicting the, uh, the coming of Muhammad, and it's, which was supposed to predate the birth of Muhammad. Yeah, we should, uh, the Quran, sh I mean, Muslims should really look for these archaeological evidences. My time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Dr. Shabir? So, ladies and gentlemen, I come to my final uh, five-minute uh, rebuttal here, and uh, I want to engage uh, with some of the points that uh, Alex uh, just uh, raised and, and some of the previous points uh, that I didn't have time previously to engage him on. Uh, now, he provoked some laughter when he criticized uh, Ibn Kathir's tafsir in a particular way. 
But you know, I criticize Ibn Kathir's tafsir as, as well. This is a commentary written by a man in the 14th century, whereas the Quran was revealed uh, seven centuries before him. So, so this man, Ibn Kathir, is a human being, is a great scholar of Islam and good for his time, and his uh, commentary has become a popular one among Muslims. But Muslims themselves laugh at some of the things that are mentioned in Ibn Kathir's commentary, as they do also with the other commentaries. It so happens that uh, Muslim commentators in the classical period, they got all kinds of information from people of the other faiths. Some of this information is ridiculous, but they incorporated that information thinking that this is coming from Jews and Christians. They must know their Bibles and they must know the old stories. And since the Quran is only alluding to those stories in a very brief way, uh, they thought it's best to get that information and incorporate it to fill out the story in the books of uh, commentary. So. I don't see that he's actually made a point that advances uh, our topic uh, tonight. Now he asked, why do the, does the Quran combine the stories uh, from the previous uh, scriptures? Well, the Quran is only alluding to the previous stories. The Quran is not telling the stories in detail. And the Quran may quickly move from one story to the next story. And if you don't know the actual stories, you may think that it looks like there's one continuous story. So this calls for further study. It calls for exegesis. But it does not call for, for just haphazardly taking the Quranic stories as they are and thinking that this is all one combined story. In, in one sh uh, page of the Quran, you may have the stories alluded to of uh, several prophets, one after another. It doesn't mean that they all lived in the same time and that this is one continuous story. But if you wanted to think of it as one continuous story, it is the bigger story of God sending prophets to, to people over time. The people disobey and disagree with their prophets. They deny them. Then God saves the prophet and his followers and destroys the others. That is the continuing saga uh, that is described in the Quran. Now, uh, Alex spent a great deal of time uh, trying to say that the Torah, as we have it now, is actually uh, still... Uh, the one Torah that is all intact, and he showed us even pictures of ancient parchments. What he didn't say is that what was discovered at the Dead Sea, in, among the Dead Sea Scrolls are actually four versions of the Torah. Now, I don't say that these versions agree in, with Islam in everything, uh, but I'm, I'm, no, they, neither do they agree with the Christian Bible in everything. And this becomes a problem for Christianity mo much more so than it becomes a problem for Islam. Because the Muslim answer is that these previous scriptures have been changed and corrupted in one place or another. But since Christians hold to the uh, uncorruptibility uh, of the Old Testament, now, you have, now we have to answer why do you have four different versions discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, so, whereas, for example, Alex says that the Quran is saying that the Quran is confirming the previous scriptures, uh, the best way of reading the Quran is to say that there are passages which uh, speak very highly of the previous scriptures, but there are also passages in the Quran which seem to indicate uh, that uh, the Christians and Jews need to follow this Quran and uh, to leave off anything that is contrary to this divine light which is now coming in the scriptures. And if one might think, well, we have some scriptures which say something differently, the Quran says, Woe to those who write the scripture with their own hands. And then they say that this is from God. That is in the second chapter of the Quran in the 79th verse. So the Quran is warning against taking other scriptures at face value and insisting that it is the Quran itself that must be taking it, uh, taken at face value. Uh, Alex uh, uh, cast some doubt on the Prophet Muhammad and his activity and when he got the revelation, not realizing that in fact the usual way in the Old Testament for people to refer uh, to, to respond to an epiphany, uh, a, a manifestation of God, is for them to be in fear. If the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was in this fear, uh, fear or a similar fear, uh, that is further explained by the nature and circumstances in which he grew up. He did not grow up in the biblical tradition to expect that the angel Gabriel will come to speak to him. He grew up in a tradition where people were, were tortured by jinns. And, and he was worried in case something like that might happen to him initially. But later on, the confirmation came to him not by what other people said, but by the continued revelation from the Almighty God. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. So this will conclude our speaking part and bring us to our question and answer session for this evening. And I see we've got uh, a lot of good questions here. 
And again, we will be only posing the questions that, and asking the questions that are related to the topic. Um, who is the true God in a form of identity? Um, so our first question would be to our guest, Alex. Um, this person is asking... Fundamentals of Christianity is based on the Trinity, but nowhere in the, nowhere is the name of the Trinity mentioned in the Bible, but the Quran mentions it. Can you explain? So you said uh, the Quran mentioned uh, word three, referring to the Trinity. I think that's what you mentioned. Well, we're not, we don't have, of course, the name Trinity in the New Testament. But as we exegete from the text, we see that the attributes of Son and Holy Spirit the same of attributes of the Father. That's why we, we conclude that God is triune. That's all. But the Quran is, of course, specifically said, say, don't say three. And meaning, like, don't say the God is triune. But also Quran said, don't, don't do think. Uh, 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 I think Jesus, uh, Allah asking Jesus, did you tell uh, your followers so they should worship me, uh, yourself, and your mother are three gods. So this, we have another idea of Trinity, quite different from the biblical idea of Trinity. Thank you. Just a quick response to that. Uh, the, the passage that uh, Alex was referring to with mention of Mary does not actually say Trinity. It, it says, uh, Did you say to people, take me and my mother as two gods uh, in addition to God or other than God? Uh, it, it does not say that this is what constitutes the Trinity. So some Christians object to the Quran and say, look, it, it, the Quran had a different idea of the Trinity. Well, the Quran doesn't say that this is what constitutes the Trinity, but the Quran is setting up a, a drama and showing that when Jesus uh, appears before God on the Day of Judgment, God will ask him in order to disprove the others, to show that those who took Jesus as a God uh, did so without warrant, and those who took Mary uh, as an object of worship uh, did so also without warrant. That's the Quranic uh, perspective here. It's not saying that this constitutes the Trinity. Our next question is to Dr. Shabir. And I gotta say, uh, somebody did their homework here and uh, has been doing their homework. Um, and there's actually some writing here, which I might get, uh, you, you might understand a little better than, than me. But it was referring to what was brought up earlier. Um, and the story about the priest who prayed at the end. And this person is asking, um, they're saying, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. God in Arabic is, and forgive me if I mispronounce the way this person has written it, Al-Ilah. And I have it written in Arabic here, and I'll show you this, so I'll show both of you this, so you can see how it's written. Not Allah. And then they have it written in Arabic. Because Allah is a proper name, like Shabir and Alex, uh, I don't understand that. So they're, st they're stating that the priest who prayed at the end of your debate was more, uh, was wrong. The Arabic translation was done in an Islamic era. It was influenced by the culture of the day. Would you admit that uh, this was wrong in saying this claim? Yeah. So uh, the um, here here a Christian wants to say, okay, Allah is not the the true God, and to say to call the biblical God Allah is mistaken. What's the evidence? Well, they say in Arabic, uh, it, it, God is referred to as Al Ila, not uh, Allah. Uh, but what has happened in Arabic, actually, is that over time, the Al-Ilah may have become contracted to Allah. Instead of saying Al-Ilah, the Arabs just smoothed it over. Instead of, for example, in English, instead of saying do not, we say don't. So we smooth over the pronunciation, shortening it, and then this becomes like a popularly used uh, word. Uh, so that's how it was in Arabic. Now, the, the questioner is saying, it looks like when they translated the Bible into Arabic, they did so in an Islamic era, and they were influenced by the Quranic uh, narrative and Quranic language, and that's why they call God Allah in the Arabic translation of the Bible. But what academic scholars will point out in response to this is that 
When you read the Quran, you see that the Quran is quoting the statements of the opponents of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and quoting the statements of Jews and Christians, and saying, uh, using the same statement, uh, using the same word, Allah, as being spoken by Jews and Christians as a reference to God. So in that era, those who spoke Arabic, whether Muslims or Christians or Jews, they used the same word, Allah, for God. Uh, and we should ask Alex to point out where in the New Testament did Jesus ever say Yahweh? Whereas on the, on the cross, it is mentioned that he called out to Eli, which is El, the same uh, corresponding word to Allah. Thank you. Alex, do you have anything to add to that? So I'm assuming this question is posed to Dr. Shabir. And this person is, is claiming that the prophets came in the name of, so it's, I'm assuming they're saying the uh, Christian prophets came in the name of Yahweh. And whose name did Muhammad come? The idea that Yahweh is the name of God has been unchallenged throughout this debate. And I want to say something about that in response to this question. It is not actually clear that Yahweh is the name of God. You see, in the, in the book of Exodus, when God spoke to Moses and Moses said, tell me your name, so when I go back to the people and tell them that God spoke to me and they ask me your name, I'll be able to tell them, God says, I am what I am. And some commentators said that that was God's way of saying to Moses, mind your own business. I am what I am. And he didn't actually give his name. But from that expression, I am what I am, the name Yahweh may have been derived, which means something like he is. So Yahweh is basically a verb, meaning he is. It's not a noun referring to a name of a person. So that could be why Jesus never actually uttered the name Yahweh in the New Testament. And that's what could be why the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, uh, did not preach that this is the name of God, but rather he used the name Allah. And he came in the name of Allah. And that was recognized as the name of God. So when the Old Testament says, speaks about somebody to come in the name of God, the Prophet Muhammad actually did come in the name of God, and that's how his Quran begins. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of God, the Beneficent, the Merciful One. Uh, do you have anything to add to that? Our next question is posed to both of our speakers. And they're asking, <coughs> excuse me, what is the character of God? Who would match that? I'd like to go first. Well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I think it's only God could match God. So God could match himself. I don't, who can match God's identity? I don't know. I mean, we can definitely look through the Old Testament and see how God said that he created human beings, male and female, according to his image and according to his likeness. I mean, from that, we can derive that we are a kind of carbon copy of God in a sense. I'm sorry, I don't want to, because we cannot be close, anywhere close to God as what we believed. So, but I guess, I think it's only us in this, on this planet who can resemble a little bit of God because God created us the way we, we have logic, we have mind, we, we can kind of create stuff from something, but God creates stuff from nothing. But that's closest, I think, resemblance. That's, that's what I think I could answer. Uh, this question to the doctor, another one, um, and it, it, it's, it's tied into what was brought up briefly, um, and regarding what is the genealogy of the prophets, what is their lineage, um, it was briefly brought, brought up when we were on some of the slides, um, if we can have both of you guys explain um, to the main prophets of, of each faith, uh, what is the lineage of them, please and thank you. I hesitated to come to the microphone because I didn't want to dominate the Q&A here. I, I want Alex to have a fair share to answer questions as well. Um, so, so let me give it a shot and then hopefully he will say something in, in response. Uh, 
Uh, in, in the Muslim tradition, the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace is a descendant of the Prophet Ishmael. And uh, this goes back to promises made by, Abra uh, made by God to Abraham, where God promised Abraham that his descendants will be numerous. Now, if, if a good Christian is here and God tells you you will have many children, then that comes as a promise from God. You say, thank you, God. But well, what does it mean? You're going to have good children, right? It doesn't mean you're going to have children who will disobey God, worship the devil, and so on. Uh, now, when God was promising Abraham that his descendants will be numerous, it means that he will have good descendants. That's the whole idea of the promise. And in fact, in, in, the, in a commentary on the Old Testament, in the Qumash, it is mentioned uh, that uh, with the rise of Islam, the promise made to Ishmael was fulfilled. So what does that mean? That means by implication that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is recognized uh, as a true prophet. It is through his teachings that that uh, prophecy is fulfilled. Now in the New Testament, attempts are made to link Jesus to David because there is the idea that he was to be the son of David, the Messiah who will rule in David's place. Of course we know that he didn't rule temporarily as, uh, as David would have ruled and the expected Messiah should have ruled, but there is the expectation that when he comes back, he will rule. And in order to link Jesus to David, uh, two different genealogies are given, one in Matthew's Gospel, one in Luke's Gospel. Uh, Luke's Gospel has the curious mention that Jesus was uh, the son of uh, Joseph, as was supposed. If we take that literally, it means that the entire genealogy is a supposed one. If we go to Matthew's Gospel, we see that uh, an attempt is being made to link Jesus to David, and uh, the accurate information probably was not available at this time. One curious fact in Matthew's genealogy is that he mentions that there are 14 generations from David to the exile, 14 afterwards, and so on. When we add them up, there should be 42 generations. But if you count the names, you will see that there is only 41 generations in Matthew's Gospel. One of them went missing somehow. Uh, so th there are problems in the genealogies uh, in, given in, in the New Testament Gospels. And in any case, it, it looks like the attempt to link Jesus to David was uh, one that led in a different direction than the actual historical reality. Thank you. Uh, what's the Persian? Only in Genesis, I believe, it's 6,000 differences. But they are so minor, they won't even... It's, it's basically a dispute between uh, two scholars over Hebrew of uh, Old Testament. Nothing to do with the uh, uh, debate between Christian and Muslims because, or Jews and Muslims because the topics are not changed. The problem is that the Quran came and they stated all the stories quite differently. So what I said basically, in order for Quran to be, to, statements of the Quran or claims of Allah to be true, all we have to do is to find the Old Testament manuscript, ancient Old Testament manuscript version 2 which predates the birth of Muhammad, which has all the stories very close, written, all the prophets very close to the Quranic narratives. And maybe Muhammad, if not mentioned specifically and implicitly, but at least given more, uh, more detailed explanations so the people of the book, according to the, again, not the Quran, mostly, well, it's Quran and also the Hadith, or the Sunnah of Muhammad, they came, they heard Muhammad speak, and they start crying because they recognize him as uh, the prophet mentioned in his books. So we have to have some kind of evidence to support it. So far we don't have evidence, we have claim after claim after claim. And also, uh, I think what I try to say, when story, let's go back to story of David shortly. In order for the story of David being corrupted, you have to really give a reason why Jews decided to split the story and attribute one part to Gideon and kept another part, the story of David and Saul. This part, they have to be logical, at least kind of, you know, idea why they decided to corrupt the story, if they really corrupted the story. So again, all the, all the Bibles we have in manuscripts which predates the birth of Muhammad and some of them predate the birth of Christ, we are very compatible, very close to our modern Bibles. I could say that we have King James only people among Christian community and NIV people, right? And they are really at each other. They try to, you know, there's a big fight going on. But if I, you know what, I could easily put, sit them, make the sit them beside the uh, bonfire and sing Kumbaya when I bring Quran into the equation. 
Because when we look around, there is no contradiction between any of these, King James or NIV. There is no much difference at all, and there's no significant difference between all the manuscripts from all languages translated to any language and compared, because the Quranical transmission of any event is very, very different from biblical. That's why I said, listen, if we have supposedly a message, I, I receive a message on my phone, a text message from my friend, and he tells me something. And then, next day, I receive the message, supposedly from my friend, it tells me quite differently. I will, I will be questioning the who, is, who is who. That's what I see in the Quran and the Bible. The stories don't match. That's why I said, oh, wait a minute, why it's so that the Quran claims, or the Muslims claims, oh, the Quran is word of the same God, Yahweh, who sent the Torah. And yet, when we, we match the Torah and the Quran, they are not matching each other. And then next question, next claim is, well, the Torah being corrupted because our Quran could not be wrong. Well, I think my time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Both, both, both well, well spoken. Better than me with my stumbling words. <laughs> um, so that will bring the stage portion of tonight's event to a close. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Alex and to thank Dr. Shabir for taking time out of their busy schedules to come here and to speak to everybody and have a dialogue with each other. I would, also like to thank, I would also like to thank the event organizers, the Islamic Info and Dawah Center International team. I would like to thank the broad, broadcast and media team, globalmuslimforums.com, and everyone tuning in on them. Have a good evening, guys. Thank you for tuning in. And the catering team, as well as the catering team. But last and not least, I would like to thank all our volunteers who took time out of their busy schedules to come and make tonight's event a success. As I mentioned before, this is a monthly lecture series entitled Islam and Other Religions. Uh, as of this point, we have not set out an official date, but the last weekend of July coming up, we have a Facebook page. You can check us out at Islam, in, uh, Islam, Info, Islam Information, Information and Dawah Center on Facebook. And we'll have some uh, updated event posting as well as maybe some photos from tonight's event. Um, so at this opportunity, I would like to give a warm welcome and thank everybody for tonight's event. Um, we have some refreshments downstairs for everybody um, that I think all of us will enjoy. I would, we didn't appreciate, uh, expect as many people, and we do appreciate having this many people here. Um, so I would ask for, and I'm giving the, our gentlemen, our brothers here in, in humanity, um, we, we got a chance, guys, to show our gentlemen, our gentlemen skills and how gentlemen we are. And we're going to ask the ladies to go downstairs first, uh, just for safety reasons. We don't want everyone to crowd downstairs through the stairs. So we'll go through the back and we'll go downstairs. And we are inviting everybody for some refreshments, some drinks, and some social time. At uh, about 8.20, we'll have the Islamic call to prayer. We'll hear the adhan. So the brothers and some of the sisters might leave and come back upstairs. But everyone is welcome to come downstairs and mingle while, while we're doing this. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Have a good evening.